Good morning, and welcome to St. Agnes. Today, we celebrate the 14th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Our readings for today's liturgy can be found in the back of the hymnal, number 1149, number 1149. Our entrance hymn is number 630, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise, number 630. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Brethren, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. <coughs> I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask, Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Stop. 
Let us pray. O God, who in the abasement of your Son have raised up a fallen world, fill your faithful with holy joy. For on those you have rescued from slavery to sin, you bestow eternal gladness. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever, amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Ezekiel. As the Lord spoke to me, the Spirit entered me and set me on my feet. And I heard the one who was speaking to me say to me, Son of man, I am sending you to the Israelites, rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have revolted against me to this very day. Heart of face and obstinate of heart are they to whom I am sending you. But you shall say to them, thus says the Lord, and whether they heed or resist, for they are a rebellious house, they shall know that a prophet has been among them. Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord, have mercy. We are filled with contempt. Indeed, all too full is our soul with the scorn of the arrogant, the disdain of the proud.
A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, that I, Paul, might not become too elated because of the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, an angel of Satan, to beat me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I begged the Lord about this, that it might leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. I will rather boast most gladly of my weaknesses in order that the power of Christ may dwell with me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and constraints for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. Jesus departed from there and came to his native place, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished. They said, where did this man get all this? What kind of wisdom has been given to him? What mighty deeds are wrought by his hands? Is he not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his native place, and among his own kin, and in his own house. So he was not able to perform any mighty deed there, apart from curing a few sick people and laying his hands on them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. The Gospel of the Lord. St. Paul, in his second letter to the Corinthians, wrote that the Lord has given me a thorn in the flesh. What this thorn is, we don't know. Scripture scholars, such as even St. Jerome, St. Augustine, have speculated. On one hand, maybe it was a medical problem, such as epilepsy, they conjure, malaria, or even indications of a failing eyesight. Others speculate that it could have been some kind of a trial and tribulation problem where people both in the church and out of the church caused great turmoil for St. Paul. Others speculate that maybe it was just a spiritual problem, that St. Paul had this persistent temptation that he had to deal with. We don't really know what it was, but we do know that St. Paul wanted that thorn taken. He says, I've prayed three times that the Lord would take it from me. Also, 
it must have been rather severe because the Greek word for thorn, sloton, really can mean anything from the little tiny kind of thorn to something like a stake upon which a person was impaled. So there we have it. One thing though, St. Paul says that the Lord gave this to me to keep me from being too elated. A better translation again would be being lifted above others, meaning becoming arrogant, like self-fulfilled. I'm doing this all on my own. Because of that thorn, St. Paul learned humility. After all, if we went a few verses prior to our passage today, St. Paul lists all the different places where he visited and established churches. He also lists all the kinds of things he encountered, but especially that he received these special revelations and experiences from Christ. Here, he must have had some kind of ecstatic experience. So St. Paul could easily have become puffed up, thinking, look at all that I have done. Look what I have accomplished. Look what the Lord has given to me. But instead, the thorn makes him humble. The thorn makes him realize he can't do it on his own. So even though he asked for the thorn to be removed, St. Paul goes on and says how Jesus himself said, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. The grace of God works on the humble heart because we're open to that grace. And with that, we realize God is with us. Grace, simply put, is a supernatural gift from God. It's a sharing in his life and love. I always like to think that, like at baptism, God is breathing life into our soul, sharing his love. That's grace. Beginning at baptism, we receive that sanctifying grace, that indwelling presence of the life and love of the Holy Trinity. As we receive the sacraments, that grace is strengthened, or especially through the sacrament of penance, that grace is restored if it has been lost by sin. There are though also those actual graces that help us to act. These graces that enlighten our intellect, strengthen our will, so that we know what is good and true and choose that. In all, though, we become cooperators with God's grace. The thorn, though, keeps us humble. And so St. Paul realized that it's not about him. It's about the Lord. He's not there to bring others to him like some kind of a cult figure or a guru. He's not called to exalt himself. He's called to bring others to Christ. He's called to exalt Christ. He's simply the instrument. So the thorn keeps him humble so that he can live that life of grace and that he can really do Christ's good work. With that, he can become a genuine witness to Christ. Now with that in mind, our spiritual task is this. Who or what is the thorn in our side? So let's think of that. Some of us here may have a rather serious medical problem or maybe just some kind of affliction. We may well have that. But does that keep us from the Lord or does it make us humble to be a real witness? For instance, Father Junipero Serra, canonized saint, feast day was July 1st. He founded, as we know, the missions in California, at least nine of those missions. So he left Mexico City, having come from Spain, left Mexico City, walked all the way. So he went from San Diego all the way up to San Francisco, establishing these missions. Probably he walked hundreds, if not thousands of miles. But do you know, he had an ulcerated leg. He had some wound that would not heal. So he was in great pain. Nevertheless, he was successful because whether it was the Native American Indians that he preached to or even the Spanish colonists, they knew this man was sincere. He wasn't doing it for fun. Quite frankly, if you had a wounded leg, would you be willing to go past San Diego and walk all the way to San Francisco? 
I don't think so. But he did it for Christ. And because of that, he was successful. So his humility and his cooperation with grace made him successful. Not necessarily even in this worldly sense, but in the eyes of Christ. Or I think of when I was newly ordained, I, had a, I knew a priest, his name was Monsignor Richard Burke. Some of you may have known him. He used to be the rector at the cathedral, then he went to Holy Spirit, and then he went to Our Lady of Lourdes where he retired. So about one year after I was ordained, the poor fellow was on vacation in Ireland with his priest friend. They had a car accident and he lost half his leg. Now imagine being about 60 years old and all of a sudden you don't have a leg. And then you have to wear a prosthesis. So when he rose in the morning, had to put on his prosthesis. At times, I knew it was painful because there were a couple of times when I lived with him for a year that he had a blister or an ulcer, but I never saw him really give in to the pain. That once or twice, maybe a little grimace from it, but he was always joyful. What an inspiration. Here are some times I would be complaining about something. I was teaching at Mar Marymount, but living at Lourdes, and it was like, I'm complaining, and yet here's this fellow who's a lot older than I am, and he's happy. But that shows you the grace of God, and what a witness that is. So think, my brothers and sisters, if we're suffering from that medical problem, simple or serious, can we use that to be the instrument for Christ, to show we're really believers? Or think, maybe we do have a problem that's caused by turmoil, tribulation by someone else. Maybe even the person sitting next to you right now. So, you didn't get that, did you? So, anyway, so you have this thorn in your side. What do you do? I remember when I was close, well, many years ago, I was teaching RCIA. A young lady enrolled with her fiance. I was doing wedding preparation. So she was Catholic. He was of a fundamentalist kind of background. He came to the class because she asked him. Also, he wanted to know more about the faith if he's going to raise his kids in the faith. So he came, but one could tell he had an edge. No sooner would I start the class, hand goes up, you know. Where does it say that in the Bible? Why do you believe that? And then he gives some kind of argument that was erroneous from his fundamentalist background and so on. And quite frankly, I thought, this guy's a pain in my side. And even times I would say, dear Lord, I hope he doesn't come tonight. But you know what? It taught me something. It taught me I had to be better prepared. I had to anticipate his questions. I also had to be more patient and not come off like arrogant in any way, but try to be compassionate and understanding. As it turns out, so after four months of this endurance, he came to see me and he said, Father, and actually I thought, this I'm in for it now, he's making an appointment. So he says, Father, I've thought about this and I want to convert. Well, that's not about me. That's the grace of God working through me. But if I'd come off like arrogant, said, don't come to class, don't ask any questions, where would you be now? So we have to remember there are those individuals that can be real thorns in our side. They might be at work. Maybe they're at school. Maybe they're in our own home or other relatives. Whoever they are, though, think about, can you be that witness for Jesus in humility and help change that person? It's not easy, but nevertheless, that's the task. Or it could be we just deal with some persistent temptation or even a persistent venial sin of some kind. I've had people come to confession and they say, Father, I'm so discouraged, I confess the same thing over and over and over again. And I tell, I tell them, I say, don't be upset with yourself. I'm glad you're confessing these sins than mortal sins or worse sins. Thank God. 
And thank God you have the grace to realize you need his help. You're seeking forgiveness. You want to grow in holiness. They're good examples. You know, people who stand in line for confession, they're good examples because they know they aren't at the high plateau above everybody else. They aren't at the canonization level. No, they're the poor little sinners trying to get to heaven. Or I've had individuals, especially men, say, Father, I deal with these persistent, lustful thoughts all the time. I try to resist them, I pray about them, and they keep coming back. When will they end? So I say, as St. Francis de Sales once said, <laughs> you will conquer your lustful thoughts 24 hours after you have died. So, you didn't get that either. So, must be the heat, folks. But anyway, the point is that we're striving for holiness. We're opening ourselves to God's grace. So take time today to think about who or what is the thorn in your side. Rather than resenting it, think about how is God using that to keep you humble? We all should remember that, to be humble, to be a good witness, to be open to his grace, and to continue his mission. That's the key. When I think about thorns, I immediately think of rose bushes because I like roses. And here you have this beautiful flower, I think the most beautiful flower of all, and yet the stems have all those thorns. I've been bitten many times by thorn bushes. But God gives us the thorn so that we can bloom into such a beautiful person, to really bloom into that image and likeness of God that he wants us to be. May God bless you. Let us stand now and profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men, for our salvation, he came down from heaven. And by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Dear Lord Jesus, you said that where two or more are gathered in your name, that you'd be in their midst and hear their prayers. With this confidence, we offer these petitions. For all our church leaders, especially Pope Francis, Bishop Burbage, and our parish priests, that they will preach the gospel with courage and conviction. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our nation, that together we will promote the common good of all, safeguard the sanctity of marriage and the family, and defend the rights to life and to religious freedom. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For justice and peace among nations, especially Ukraine and the Middle East, and for those who serve in our law enforcement, military, diplomatic, and intelligence services to make peace, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For Christians who face persecution and genocide, especially in communist and Islamic countries, that the Holy Spirit will keep them strong in the faith, 
and for all non-believers, that the Holy Spirit will move them to faith in our divine Savior. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the Israeli hostages and all the innocent victims of war, terrorism, and violence, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the end of the drought and the blessing of rain, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the acceptance of vocations to the priesthood and religious life, that young men and women from our own families will heed Christ's call and offer their lives to him who gave his life for us. And for our parish seminarians, Gabriel Godet, Michael Gibbons, John Anthony Buono, and Andrew Garcia, and for Sister Monica Baptiste Whalen and Sister Abigail Therese Jones, novices for the Dominican Sisters in Nashville, and Joanna Shaw, postulant for the Carmelites in Port Tobacco, Maryland. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the sick and homebound, especially Father Pinizzato, Alex Paxton, and John Tui, and for our deceased, especially Fumi Sawamura, Patricia Trupp, and Kevney O'Connor, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our living and deceased parishioners for whom this Mass is offered, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And for our own personal intentions, which we offer in the quiet of our hearts, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask you to hear all our prayers, even those prayers held within our hearts, and to grant them in accord with thy divine will. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In calling upon the prayers of our Blessed Mother, we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now at the hour of our death. Amen. Our offertory hymn is number 713, I Has Not Seen, number 713.
Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good, good of all his holy church. <coughs> may this oblation dedicated to your name purify us, O Lord, and day by day bring our conduct closer to the life of heaven. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For out of compassion for the waywardness that is ours, he humbled himself and was born of the Virgin Mary. By the passion of the cross, he freed us from unending death, and by rising from the dead, he gave us life eternal. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. Indeed, holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise, for through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread. And giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me.
the mystery of faith. We proclaim your death. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you willed to reconcile us to yourself, grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with St. Agnes and with all the saints, on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world, be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth, with your servant Francis our Pope and Michael our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other the sign of peace.
Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, my soul shall be healed.
Our poor box collection today is for the Little Sisters of the Poor in Washington. Let us pray. Grant, we pray, O Lord, that having been replenished by such great gifts, we may gain the prize of salvation and never cease to praise you through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go forth, the Mass has ended. Thanks be to God. St. Michael, the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Hosts, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan, and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the root of souls. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 996, America the Beautiful. Number 996. We will sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Mm -hmm. 